welcome everybody to another edition of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck. And of course, as always, that means some smart talk radio uh, is certainly in your future in the next uh, several minutes. Uh, should be a good one indeed. We're going to be talking to Robert Fowler about a brand new important work called The Gun Club, the USS Duncan at Cape Esperance. Interesting, interesting work celebrating really pretty much the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Cape Esperance. It's an entertaining book for sure. Uh, who is Robert Fowler? Well, he is the son of the SS Duncan's torpedo officer, Lieutenant Robert Ludlow Fowler III, who died during the Navy's first planned battle of the Pacific War during World War II. He has also worked as a documentary filmmaker, off-Broadway producer, screenwriter, director, and much more. Should be an interesting conversation indeed. Robert, uh, how are you, my friend? I'm very well, Warner. Thanks well, for having me. Well, we're very pleased to have you here. Let's do this. Let's give our Lewis at Large audience a little bit more background about yourself. It says you've done some off-Broadway producing as well as documentary films. Tell us a, yes, a little bit. I grew bit. up in New York, and uh, I was a p- producer, and then uh, moved to California and became a screenwriter. Okay, that's almost, the law requires you out there to be a screenwriter, doesn't almost, it? Almost, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Obviously, the family connection, uh, important, important to you, but give us a little bit of a setup about the, the SS Duncan a little bit, and, and what led you to want to put this into book form? Well, my father died before I was born. Growing up, I, I always knew there was something suspicious about his death. The family always kind of whispered about it, and they never really explained, you know, when I'd ask what had happened, nobody really ever knew. I, I didn't really think about it much, because I didn't know how to begin to even figure anything out at that point. But when my grandfather died in 1971, he left me this huge suitcase packed with papers that he'd been collecting over the years about the battle and newspaper clippings and all, anything he thought might relate to it. I had that in a closet for years and years. And then I decided at one point to kind of go through it and see what it was about. And, but it was also beyond me at that point that I couldn't really figure anything out. And then my mother was invited. This is 50 years after the battle or something, 40 years after the battle. My mother was invited to the first reunion of the Duncan crew. So she said she'd go if I went with her. And so we went to Fort Lauderdale and, and sat in a motel and <laughs> listened to these guys reminisce about the battle and the war and all that. The amazing part of it to me was that it turned out that none of these guys on the ship had any idea what had happened to them. They were all baffled by it themselves. And so I went to nine or ten of these reunions. Each time we'd sit around and talk and I'd record them and slowly we started putting the pieces together. Each person had sort of their own theory and their own ideas. Over the years we kind of, we sort of unraveled the mystery. And it was a mystery because the Duncan, it it was in a task force of four cruisers and five destroyers. And it alone wound up between the uh, Allied fleet and the Japanese fleet. And so it was sunk really by both sides. And so that's why the family was so confused. My mother thought the captain had gone off to be a hero and gotten them all killed. And so when I approached the project, that's what I was thinking. Robert, you said they were between both sides. Did the American side not know that the Duncan was out there? No, they thought it was was a Japanese ship because it was so far out of position. I mean, what really happened is that the Duncan's orders were to, when they saw the Japanese fleet, they were to to charge and, and attack them with torpedoes and then light them up so that the cruisers could sink them. That was the plan. And so when the Duncan saw the Japanese fleet, they took off after them. But radar was so primitive at that point, and nobody trusted radar. Right. So nobody really acknowledged when they saw ships on radar, they thought it was a mistake. It turned out really only the Duncan did what was ordered. All the other ships just stayed in column and were oblivious. So whether... Until the battle actually started. Yeah. So whether they really liked it or knew it at the time, they were basically almost on like a kamikaze mission. They were on a kamikaze mission. Yeah, and they knew it too. The people on the ship knew it. They thought this isn't right. As far as you can ascertain, that seems sort of un- unusual. Is there any reason why in this particular case they were ordered to do that versus any other battle? This was the first actual planned battle of the war. Every other battle before this, Midway and Carl Sea, you know, they just kind of stumbled into the other fleet and, you know, they did what they could to survive. This was a battle where the Admiral actually had a plan and the plan didn't get executed very well, but it was the first time they actually had a plan. <laughs> And then there was a series of battles after this in exactly the same spot. They were trying to stop the Japanese from reinforcing Guadalcanal. And the Japanese always came down at night, so these were all night battles. There were four of them in a row within a month, and they all took place in exactly the same place, right off Savo Island. And they all ended more or less in the same, you know, <laughs> sort of uh, not right. distinguished themselves exactly. But they got a little better at it each time. Yeah, we just recently had uh, an author on talking about the battle at Guadalcanal and, and the intensity there. That one did more or less the same mistakes. That was even more confusing. That had so many ships in Involved. Yeah, I, I think maybe I, I have a theory about this, but I'd like to ask you this as, as an author and, and someone that has direct ties to World War II. But there has been a proliferation in the last decade, movies and books and television films, etc., about very specific
specific things that happened in World War II, almost an obsession with it, and that's not being critical. But why, what's your theory about that? Why so much now? Well, you know, these guys who were in World War II, they never talked about it. Their wives all said the same thing, that, uh, that I ta- the ones I talked to, that their husband would never talk about the war, never wanted to mention it. And then like 50 years later or 40 years later when they retired, then they sort of, I guess grandchildren started asking them questions or something. I think it's something to do with that. I think there was a long silence. I'm sure that's going to happen with other wars. I'm sure we'll see that happening with Vietnam. and It's just starting now with Vietnam. People are talking about it. Yeah. So I think there's a period where the people involved just don't want to talk about it. Right. I think I agree with you. I also think there is a also a very real need and a desire, quite frankly, on uh, some baby boom people, those that write articles and make films and, and write books like this, to give homage and to pay tribute to that generation that communication and open communication was not necessarily their strength or anything that they revered that much and people like yourself that want to make sure that these stories are told. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people who just want to find out what happened to their father. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, when I went to school, you know, it wasn't odd that my father was dead because there were, you know, half a dozen other people in the class had dead fathers. You know, it didn't seem like a strange thing to me at the time. And again, if you just joined us, yours truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck of Lewis at Large Radio. Got a good one going here talking about the Gun Club, an important new work about the USS Duncan at Cape Esperance. The first, is, as they said, real battle in the Pacific of World War II. The book has extraordinary detail, not only in its storytelling or in its fact-relating, but also in some of the graphs and everything else. That was obviously very, very important to you. Yeah, it was. You know, what's unique about this book, really, is it's told by the guys on the ship. It's a non-fiction version of the Kane Mutiny. You know, it's, uh, it, it's a day-to-day life of this ship, as told by the guys. It all takes place in one year, 1942. It starts in January and ends in December when they come home from the ones who survive come home. You just understand how they feel. You, you really get a feeling of what it was like to be on a destroyer during World War II. How much did you rely on the U.S. military for a lot of your research? And tell us a little bit about the research process for you. How long did it take and what were some of the different sources besides the people that were either there or the people that, that knew people that were there? Well, if you ask my wife, it, it took like 40 years. So, but, uh, <laughs> you know, while I was working in Hollywood, I was always sort of alert to, uh, you know, if information came out, I was collecting it. And not that I ever wanted to write anything. I mean, what happened with the writing part is I got so much information. After 10 years of going to these reunions, I realized that I had so much information that nobody else knew that I, I sort of felt responsible for writing it down. I wasn't sure I could. It took me about 10 years to write the book once I started actually writing it. When you started to write this, uh, I know obviously, again, the, the family connection with your father. But was there anything in particular you were hoping you would find or did you go into it pretty much a blank canvas and said, OK, let's start doing some research and see what we come up with? I thought I was going to find that the captain had done something horrible and should have been punished for it, which is what my mother thought. Here's what what was interesting that happened right after this battle. The Navy suddenly realized that they needed captains who would fight. You know, there were five or six other ships in this battle where the captains didn't do anything. You know, they, they chose not to do anything. And the captain of this ship was the one who actually charged in. So he was immediately promoted. Actually, in the end, he wound up a vice admiral. He commanded the, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he commanded the naval forces that cordoned off Cuba. And the St. Lawrence Seaway was opened. He commanded the first American ships through the canal. The Navy had high regard for him. And it was because he would fight. He was willing to risk it. And so there were a lot of uh, armchair generals that were sidelined at that point. And they were looking for the guys who would actually go out there and do it. You said you were born after your father died. Did your mother ever remarry? She did, yes. She married a professor of uh, French history at MIT. What about uh, what about your connections with others who lost a parent as part of the USS Duncan? Have you, have you communicated with them? And oh, what as part are, what of the are... Duncan? I've met, a, I've met a few of them, and they're all fascinated to know what happened. I mean, they're, they're the same way. I, I mean, they didn't write the book, but they, they're equally interested. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll see what their reaction is. You know, as, as you look back on this particular thing, and again, again, you said you, you went into this thing thinking that you were going to be able to point some fingers somewhere. Did your respect for for not only the mission, but what the entire war effort was all about. Did it grow or did it change your perspective about World War II change at all as a result of your research? I tell you what I'm enormously impressed by is how quickly the Navy learned. You know, they'd have terrible disasters, but they didn't really have them twice in a row. You know, they, they, they actually changed very quickly they adapted within a year they really had it down how to fight a, how to fight with destroyers and cruisers but it, it took a year of testing and mistakes they got very good at it and within a year the Japanese were retiring from the Pacific essentially yeah. drawing for the next 
two years. What we all forget about that whole period is that none of the people in the Navy at that point had ever been in a battle. There hadn't been a battle you know, for 40 years since the, since the Philippines. So it was all new to everybody. So this begs the question, you're a documentary filmmaker, you're an off-Broadway producer. Maybe this is presumptuous of me. I don't see this as an off-Broadway play, but I could certainly see a film. Surely you've been yeah, rolling I that I, idea I think actually make a great movie, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't. Uh, I'm way past making movies at this point. I just can't face the whole thing of raising money and all that stuff uh, or going around to studios and begging. But I think somebody might recognize the possibilities of it. It's very dramatic. Well, one of the things I'm curious about, too, is those that have seen this, seen the work and, and read some of your research and, and read read some of the book, advanced copies, or at least heard about it. I'm curious, what did they learn possibly from you that they didn't know? It's only been sent really to military journals and military people. You know, they're used to reading kind of cut and dried histories of battles or histories of ship where there aren't people involved. This one is really told, you know, from such a personal level that you get to know individual sailors quite well on you know in the course of this year you know you know their backgrounds and, and how they are and the ones who are troublemakers and the ones who aren't and and i think what surprised a lot of the military people is is that you know the, the humanity of the story they're not used to seeing that sort of thing in a military book i don't think suddenly a ship really isn't a ship it's simply a, a vehicle that's housing a bunch of human beings exactly so like moby dick or something yeah to do this over again if you if if they could dial back to just the hour before the Duncan left uh, out on its mission, would they have done it again? Oh, yes. I mean, it was a matter of controlling the sea at night. Guadalcanal could not be won, could not be won until the Japanese could be stopped resupplying the troops there. So it had to be stopped somehow. I mean, either the Japanese were able to continue or the U.S. was able to stop them. That was the only way that Guadalcanal could have been won. You know, you talk a lot about it, learning about the people that were on that boat. In the own unique way, since you did all the research here, what did you learn about the father you never knew? Sounds like a really good guy. You know, I've heard a lot of people say after their father, you know, people who didn't know their father when they do research on I just saw a thing on the other night of Humphrey Bogart's son did a short documentary on his father. What he learned was that he was very much like his father. And I think that's probably what I learned. He sounds like me in a lot of ways. I mean, he died when he was 21, and I'm 70. Right. You know, it's kind of ridiculous for me to even say that. He seemed like a good guy. He was, you know, he was on the he was on the crew at Harvard, and, uh, you know, he was, he was he was quite an accomplished fellow. So who knows? He wanted, I think he wanted to be a politician. He probably would have been a successful one. Well, this book has a decidedly personal angle for you, obviously, but it's an important piece of history. And I'm curious, just as a writer, and again, just drawing on your your documentary filming, which is trying to bring facts and bring stories and put it into context for people, has this motivated you to maybe do another book, possibly, about a similar subject? first thing people say when you finish a book is, what are you doing next? I'm so exhausted by this one. I never thought I'd finish it. But I'm sure I'll do something. You know, I don't know what I'll do, but I'm looking forward to the next the next act. Well, again, let me take you out of yourself. If, if someone had been commissioned, not you, but a historian uh, with no human or family connection of any kind would have written the same piece, what's different about yours than might have been about theirs? From a true well, historian. I don't think they would have spent as much time tracking down the sort of mundane details of life on a ship. They would have just told the story in a more cursory kind of way. This is full of like fist fights and and you know things that were happening that wouldn't have wouldn't have shown up in the historical record. People doing all kinds of things. I mean, this is a ship with 240 men. You know, they were all kids really, and these were guys who you know the crew was all guys who'd grown up during the Depression when the Navy opened up in 1940 or whatever it was. They uh, you know these guys rushed in because it was the first job they were able. To to get and they were thrilled to have it so they were people who had suffered for a long period of time and, and they were really pretty thrilled to be in the navy and and they were very different than former navy guys the old navy guys from the 30s but uh, these guys saw this as a chance to make something of themselves and so it was a different kind of navy that was evolving in the 1940s well it is an extraordinary work about an extraordinary ship an extraordinary event with a unique uh, extraordinary perspective a son writing about a ship that carried his father uh, in World War II. It's called the Gun Club, USS Duncan at Cape Esperance. Uh, it really, really highly detailed. Now, Warner, I just wanted to say that I, uh, the book has a website. It's thegunclubbook.com. Right. The website is called thegunclubbook.com. But also, what about some of the other work that you've done? Robert, do you have a personal website that people can go check out some of your other work? No, I actually don't, I'm afraid to say. I, I'm kind of computer illiterate, basically. Okay. <laughs> 
but if people tell me I should, I prefer to remain more anonymous. Well, maybe robertfowler.com is in your future. But, maybe, uh, maybe. Again, I want to remind everybody, the work, uh, the gun club, U.S. Duncan at Cape Esperance by Robert Fowler. Uh, again, the website uh, to check it out is thegunclubbook.com, and we assume that this will be available uh, Amazon and pretty much all the it's quality It's available books. on Amazon now, and uh, yeah, Kindle and audiobook and all the whole works. Thank you very much. It doesn't sound like another book, at least, is in your immediate future. Not immediately, no. But no, it uh, might be the next 40 years. I would think you spend some time thinking, what kind of a film could this be? And, I do. I do think about it. Well, listen, thanks so much for your time. And we'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.